welcome you to our service this morning. If you're visiting with us, uh, we're excited to have you with us. I'm going to call attention to one young man. Uh, Joyce, introduce uh, Mr. McLeod back there. Okay. Ed? Yes. Ed was the first one to give me, goodness, however long ago, a year ago, a copy of the Chosen videos. And he was one of the first investors with that group down in Texas. And uh, he's with us. Uh, he was uh, Joyce's uh, stepson in law, stepson. And uh, he's here to worship with us today, and we're just excited to have you with us and that you believed in that mission that those, uh, that group was putting together in, uh, in putting together the chosen ministry. So welcome to First Baptist Church. Let's give him a big First Baptist welcome. <laughs> Many of us have gotten, gotten a lot of good out of the chosen ministry videos and going on YouTube and, and watching. He said the first of the next series is Easter. By Easter. Okay, so be looking for that. Um, if you're visiting with us, we want you to take a, a card out of the pew pocket and fill that out so we can have some information about uh, you and and then we can share with you uh some things through a contact about our our church. So uh, fill those cards out. You can put them in the drop box in the back, uh, just straight back by the stained glass windows. I want to remind you that uh, the Bible drive is still going on. Now, we had a goal of how many? Yeah, yeah. We had a mistaken goal of 3,000. And, and how many do we have somewhere around? Okay. And we, I received money yesterday and again uh, this morning. And so we're going to hit that 5,000 mark and go over it too. So uh, John cautioned us about setting goals. He said, you know, let's just let the Lord set the goal. Isn't it going to be great as these Bibles are sent all around the world, and uh, people, 20, 20 people per Bible will read these, and uh, you just do the math on 5,000, and, and you'll see how many people will be impacted. That's going to be running through April, so uh, you can be a part of that and read the announcement in the bulletin. I uh, want to remind you that uh, uh, we have a men's night of worship on March the 19th. That's a Friday evening. We're going to start at 5 with the sack lunch supper, and uh, then we will begin to worship with Daniel Brimer, uh, Casey Wolf, Dan, Dan Mears is going to be here with us. Uh, my son Levi is going to be uh, preaching to us the theme interpretation, uh, uh, Torch of Truth from Romans 1.16, and then Brother Brett's going to lead us in a, in a time of prayer that I think is going to be awesome and a great time of commitment. Guys, sign up. Sign up to come and be a part of that. And if you want to just call the office and let Dinah know that you're coming, uh, that'll be good enough. But we want, to, want you to sign up so we know how many sacks to get ready uh, for the sack lunch. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful evening of worship as we come together. We and First Baptist Church of Buckner are sponsoring this together. So uh, you come and be a part of that, uh, that special evening. And then I uh, want to remind you that this week is the week of prayer, and we saw the two mission stories. Uh, Napa, Idaho is not very far from where we were last summer. Uh, Norby, if you just, just so you get your geography right, it's, it's there in the canyon, the Snake River Canyon area. And uh, that's one of the stories in this prayer guide. It's in your bulletin. I encourage you to take that and to pray through uh, one of those uh, each, uh, each day this week. 
And then some real exciting things tonight are going to happen. Uh, we're going to ordain two deacons to uh, the deacon ministry, and we're going to uh, ordain Joel Carpenter to the uh, pastoral ministry. And uh, that's going to be fun. If you're an ordained minister or deacon, uh, we have an ordination council that meets at 5 o'clock. And I uh, want you to be a part of that. That will be in the choir suite. And then at 6 o'clock back here in the sanctuary will be our ordination service. And we're going to pray for these men and their wives and just pray that uh, uh, they are able to walk in the spirit uh, with the Lord as, as they continue in their, their ministry. And really, we're just recognizing what God's already doing in their life. He's already called them. And they're working and serving, and so we're just recognizing that. This morning in our service, if you look at the order of service, uh, we're going to hear a testimony from Joel Carpenter first after Miss Stephanie uh, sings, uh, How Can It Be to Us? And then after we worship, then uh, Chris B. Sos and Mark Kellogg are going to come in, in that order and share with us their testimony as well. So. Uh, be in prayer for the service right now. I want you to bow your head and let's do exactly that. You just quiet your heart and ask God, what is it that you want from me in this service? As we come to worship, we're, we are coming to worship God. What is it that he wants from you? And then just respond. And then ask that question that we always need to ask. Lord, search my heart. Let him look at that area of need in your life. And be ready to receive from him. Because he loves us. With an everlasting love. Holy Spirit, as we come together to worship you, we thank you so much for your goodness and mercy. And Lord, I just pray that you will guide us as we move through the service and uh, that we'll be able to glorify and honor you in all ways. And Lord, those things that you want to point out in our lives that we need to lay at the altar. May we be willing to do exactly that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Going to sing for us. I want you to be in prayer for uh, Brother Brett and Miss uh, Julie. They're quarantined. They don't have any symptoms. They're well, but uh, getting a lot of things done around the house. I know what that's all about. <laughs> have to come back to work to rest but uh, be in prayer for them their uh, daughter-in-law Rochelle tested positive and they were had the grandkids all over them and uh, were with them on Tuesday night so uh, we always want to be careful and err on the side of caution so they're quarantining and uh, hopefully they'll be back with us by next Friday so anyway be in prayer for them I am guilty Ashamed of what I've done What I've become These hands are dirty I dare not lift them up to the Holy One. You plead my cause, you write my wrongs, you
you down Inside I doubt that you still love me But in your eyes there's only grace now this one more time. Good morning. How are we? There we go. Um, so if you don't know who I am, my name is Joel Carpenter. I'm the student pastor here. Um, and then I have the, the great opportunity just to share my testimony. Um, and if you don't know what that is, um, that's just simply in short what God has done in my life and how he um, brought me from death to life um, spiritually. And so what does that look like um, for me, especially as I um, am ordained into gospel ministry tonight? Um, one, well, um, I, I was somebody who did not know Jesus. Um, I, I grew up, um, and, and actually I was adopted at the age of three. And so you, if you don't really know who I am, um, I am one of 11, okay? And my parents were insane. They adopted <laughs> nine of us. Seriously, that's, yes. Yeah, yeah. And so... Um, no, that was the, one of the kindest things they did is they, um, they pursued kids um, who nobody wanted. Um, if you look at adoption, normally um, people want the perfect kid with the perfect health, the perfect race, whatever they think that might be. Um, and so those are normally the kids that people pursue. And um, my parents felt this conviction, hey, you're, you know, we're calling you to adopt. And with probably with hesitation, um, they stepped forward into that. And then the, the, it began to change. Hey, we want you to adopt kids that, that have deformities, that have difficult home lives, who have been um, rejected. And so my parents faithfully did that. And so they stepped into that. And one um, adoption after another, after another, after another, it led to nine kids um, who had no hope, um, now invited into um, a family that, that offered a lot of hope. Um, and so with that being said, I grew up with um, a lot of siblings, a lot of different characteristics of, of what made us who we are, a lot of um, different just personalities, and it was awesome. Um, but one thing my parents did um, that, 
that is better than anything they've ever done. And I said this on the, in the Christmas Eve services. Um, they didn't adopt me. They didn't adopt Andrew or Aaron or Jesse or Isaac or any of them. It's, they invited us into the love of Jesus. They began to explain and expand on who Jesus Christ was. That that is the greatest decision that they chose. Not to financially give to, to being able to adopt kids, but to actually invest their time into us and say, hey, this is who Jesus is. And are they perfect? No. I mean, nobody is. But they began to express, hey, this is what it looks like to follow Jesus. This is what it looks like for Jesus to love you. This is in the, my mess how I can represent Christ in my, the best of my ability. And they did it very, very well. And so I had a great relationship with my mom. She was the one who got me. And then my dad is the one who uh, went to go get Jamie. And we were the two overseas kids. And so my mom and I always had a pretty great relationship, pretty close and tight knit. And so we were able to uh, begin to explain more into, hey, who is Jesus? And about at the age of eight, that's when I began to really take that step of bold faith and, and follow Jesus for the first time. I remember vividly walking down the aisle um, at my old church plaza and saying, I want to follow Jesus, and I also I want, to, I want to be baptized. And so we walked through this class together. We do this little book. This is what you know, salvation looks like. This is what baptism is, and, and I was able to get baptized. Um, and normally people are like, that's it. That's the stop. No, it just continues. Um, I believe your testimony, it's never like done being written until Jesus calls you home. And so um, my story continued. I, I had a, a great life, continued to grow up, and then I had like this dream, I want to be a landscape architect. Um, and so I wanted to make a lot of money and do what I like to do. And that's doing landscape. And so I uh, was super happy for that. We moved here in 2008, 2009. We began to attend this church in 2014. And that's when I began to get in contact with Devin. If you don't know who Devin is, Devin was the, the student pastor here um, before, before I was. And so I began to build a close relationship with him. And one thing Devin did well was he discipled students. He intentionally sought out somebody who he could tell needed somebody, and he would be intentional with them. And that just so happened to be me. And I tell people this all the time. It sounds terrible. I hated it here when we first started. I did. Because I had, no, I had just been really, I mean, broken by the church we had attended before, and that was, that was my home. Those are the friends I had made. That's the, the family that I had kind of built up. And so coming here was difficult. It was a different atmosphere. It was different people. But the one thing that God did was he placed Devin in my life. And so Devin, he began to uh, pour into me. He began to just find what I was good at. He began to say, hey, like encourage me. He began to um, just challenge me. And so a couple years um, keep going by and we build a relationship, but it was actually in 2014 that summer, um, I felt the call in the ministry and uh, I hated it. I was so like, no, okay? Like I knew what I wanted to do. And so I felt that call in the ministry and though I had come forward and said, man, I'm all in, in the background, I was like, but I'm not. Like I'm not good enough for ministry and frankly, I just don't wanna do ministry. Um, and so God just like slapped me in the back of the head and said, um, suck it up, you're doing it. And so um, I'm doing it, all right? And so a couple of years go by and I'm struggling with that call and I'm also struggling in my own life. I experience anxiety, I experience the, um, difficult circumstances and uh, you know, junior year hits, senior year hits and now we're headed into my college years. Do I actually take this seriously? My first semester was a joke. My second semester I'd probably wasted my time and then God really kind of just pushed me down and said hey let's do this and so I began to attend Midwestern and uh, that's when everything began to change I began to find my love for scripture I began to find my my niche for preaching I began to find um, what community looks like what discipleship looks like and began to build this type of ministry that God had called me into um, and it's been one of the greatest joys of my life because I'm beginning to be able to step into something um, that is bigger than myself. I get to pour into students that um, they seem as though they have no hope. Um, I get to begin to build relationships that don't just last a, a few months, a few years, but a lifetime. And so you guys as a church have been so kind to like build me up there because I'll remember being that little punk of a kid trying to preach a message that lasted an hour and a half. And now I'm here like, all right, look. Here we go. 
Um, and so to be here um, right before you this morning and just to stand and say, hey, like I, if I ever would have thought to be ordained the gospel ministry, I would have laughed at you and walked away. Um, but God's funny and God knows what he's up to and God obviously calls who he calls. And the, the problem is, is are we going to step forward in faith and, and trust him in that? And so as, as Chris and um, Mark also come up here, there's a difference um, between us three. We're three different people. And though I'm in gospel ministry and though they're um, going and being ordained as deacons, there's also a similarity. Um, somebody once said that gospel, uh, that gospel ministry off the stage is just as important as gospel ministry on the stage. So though I'm a pastor, mm, the value that we have together is just as strong, that bond. Because Christ has called them the same as he's called me. I just get to do it on a stage as an imperfect person. And they get to do it off the stage as imperfect people with the same mission, with the same mind, with the same gospel mission movement. And so that's where we are today. And so that's my story, and it always changes, and it's going to continue to change. But in short, this is what God did in my life. He called me. He invited me into a family that accepted me for who I was. They shared Christ with me. They loved me well. They pointed me to him daily. I accepted him or received him as Christ as Lord, and, and I struggled a lot. And that's, that's Christian, Christianity, it's a process. But as that process has happened, I've had faithful pastors pour into me, I've had people pray for me, I've, I've had even people give, and that's why I am where I am. And though you will see me mess up, you will see me jack up a little bit and make some still, silly mistakes, I do ask that you be patient with me, you be gracious, and you continue to give me the same mercy that Christ has given you um, and me as well, because ministry, it, it's difficult, it really is. But it's the greatest joy of my life, and it's because of people like you. And so I would um, encourage you, as, as Chris and Mark come up, that you would give them that same energy, that same excitement, because God is doing something here. I don't know what. I can't even really explain it, but he's doing something, and I get to see it at the forefront. It is incredible. And so um, I would just encourage you just to give him an applaud right now and just thank him for how he's working right now. Thanks. <laughs> Always great to hear how God is using and calling on the lives of his people, right? Let's stand up and worship our Heavenly Father this morning. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring.
There's no God like Jehovah. 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 Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice to hear our jubilee and down of Zion till salvation comes. Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice to hear our jubilee and down of Zion till salvation you may be seated. Amen. Bless the Lord. As they're finding their seats, I want to invite uh, Chris Vesos and Mark Kellogg, if you'll come to the platform together. And they are going to share a word of testimony. Uh, these two are being ordained as deacons in our church. They've been through this last year's deacon in training and been serving the Lord. And it's because they've been serving the Lord that uh, we recognize what God is doing in their life. And so you uh, lift them up as they share their stories with us. Chris. Thank you, thank you. I'm not as uh, good at public speaking as Joel is, so have a little grace with me, please. But while I was thinking of what I was going to say concerning my testimony, I was faced with uh, realizing the many challenges I've had in my life. So for my childhood, it wasn't very consistent. For me, change was normal. My dad had a job working for the federal government. And this meant that we transferred where we lived quite a bit. I went to uh, five different grade schools, two middle schools, and four different high schools. So as you can see, we, it was quite the challenge. So, but my, my father was raised Greek Orthodox, and my mother was raised Southern Baptist. <laughs> and my father refused to go to a Baptist church, and my uh, mother refused to go into a Greek Orthodox church. Um, we, now, we did find a, a way to go to church during Easter and Christmas, but you can see that going to church consistently growing up was a challenge. But let's remember, God is good, and God is very good at challenges. And he presented this opportunity for me. Every summer, and I mean every summer, um, my family would stay with my Southern Baptist grandparents in between moves. And they were very devout people. And this was a wonderful opportunity for me to know who Jesus Christ was. For, you know, staying with my grandparents meant um, going to church, um, going to Sunday school, um, going to Wednesday night potluck, if you guys remember that, and, and a, a, a message. And always VBS. VBS was big um, every summer, and that's Vacation Bible School. And during 1978, um, at age eight years old, uh, me and my sister went forward um, to become, uh, to get, to ask for baptism. We followed up with uh, my grandparents' pastor, um, Reverend Duell, and that following Sunday, we were baptized. We were baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost into newness of life led by Jesus. Now, I knew that I was part of something greater than myself now. See, in Jesus, you are forgiven. In Jesus, you are loved. In Jesus, you are made whole. And this is why I was honored to be asked to become a deacon to join a group of men who proclaim Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and put this into action by serving others. I've been doing deacon duties with, uh, for the past year 
um, as a deacon in training under the watchful eye of uh, Pastor Randy and these great group of men. Uh, I also want you to get to know me a little bit. So there's other areas in this church that I do serve, and I want you to know that I am currently your youth Sunday school coordinator. I'm very much still in love with my wife, and her name's Michelle, and we've been married for 20 years. And <clears throat> me and her, we, we are your uh, Sunday school teachers for the 10th and 11th and 12th grade kids. We also do, um, we're youth leaders on Wednesday nights, and we help Joel out with whatever he needs, and we, we've, we just helped out um, with the big event that we had at Renew Weekend. I have a wonderful daughter, Alyssa, and she is a superstar. And her, and her longtime boyfriend, um, Lincoln, which I'm very proud of. And I just wanted you to know during her new weekend that they took time off from college just to come down here um, to serve their God and their church. I also helped um, Miss Don during our VBS. Um, I, I led some kids. And... I can see the irony there. Once I was saved at a VBS, and now I, I, I help out. Um, I'm also part of the uh, prayer ministry closet with uh, James Hernandez. And if you look down at your bulletin, I'm supposed to be there right now. <laughs> we, are, we, we are a family that loves God and loves to serve. My wife and I both have had challenges in our life. But... We feel a calling to work with our youth, to help them grow in their faith, to invest in their lives, and to help them walk through their challenges, and to remind them that they are always loved and accepted by their Lord and Savior. I feel a calling on my life to serve, and it's been an honor for me to um, be, become one of your guys' deacons. I feel so blessed that this church has loved me and my family so much. And I hope to serve this church for very many years to come. I want to leave you with this thought. It's from Romans, from the Lord, in Romans 8, 39. For I am convinced that nothing can separate you from the love of God. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons. Nor your fears for today, and there are many. Or your worries for tomorrow. That's your anxieties. Not even the power of hell itself can separate you from the love of God. Those are things that are just out of your control. So if you've had challenges in your past, or if you're presently in a challenge, I want you to remember something. That God is good, and God is very good at challenges, and you are loved more than you know. Thank you. Good morning. I wanted to speak with you this morning about how I came to know Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. But before I do that, I need to kind of take a step back and tell you a little bit about my family. <clears throat> While growing up in Independence, Missouri, I was blessed to know two sets of grandparents and two sets of great-grandparents. And it was one of these great-grandparents that was very instrumental in my life as a Christian. <clears throat> my great-grandmother, Hazel Schuster, was a strong Christian woman, and she often told me that she was praying for me and for my family. And my, <clears throat> my grandma would also tell me about wonderful church camps that were offered through Kansas City Youth for Christ, where they offered all kinds of fun activities for kids, such as horseback riding, and off-road biking, all the while getting to learn more about the gospel. However, during those years, I was very active in Boy Scouts. <clears throat> and the time that I would spend in Boy Scout summer camp conflicted with the time that was uh, offered to me through Kansas City Youth for Christ. So my parents, they found uh, that, that our church 
had a summer camp that would happen right after uh, scout camp. And so this gave me a wonderful opportunity. Being a teenager, I love being outdoors. I still do. But to th the thought of being able to spend up to three weeks straight camping in the middle of my summer was something that I really looked forward to. And so in the summer of 1982, after spending my time in Camp Osceola with, with my Boy Scout troop, where we learned about snakes and what leaves not to touch and sailing and hiking and all kinds of other scout activities, <clears throat> my brother Scott and I, along with two friends from our church, went to Camp Sharon in Lake of the Ozarks. And that experience at Camp Sharon was very different than scout camp because we found ourselves spending times in small groups where we were talking about sin, sacrifice, and the need for a savior. <clears throat> Excuse me. At that camp, each evening, we would uh, come together and, and spend time in a church-wide worship where a guest speaker would uh, share from God's word and then invite the campers to come forward if they felt led by the Holy Spirit to accept the gift of Jesus' sacrifice. And I was, a, I was kind of a shy kid uh, back in that time. And so I, I, I waited until about halfway through the, the camp when, when I just knew that it was my time. But I was still nervous. But it was at that time that I felt as if the Holy Spirit had taken me by the hand and walked with me down to the front of the camp where with tears of joy in my eyes, I told the speaker that I knew that I was a sinner and I was in need of a savior. The remaining time of that camp, I found myself spending time with counselors who took their time to help me to understand the decision that I had made. And for the first time in all my years of camping, I was actually looking forward to coming home because I couldn't wait to get back and tell my great grandmother that I had accepted Christ's sacrifice to pay for my sin debt. And with her help, I began digging into God's word. Now, a few years passed <clears throat> after that. I graduated high school, started attending college, and <clears throat> started a family of my own where by that time I had two kids, Holly and Adam, and we joined uh, First Baptist in Raytown, where I uh, had an opportunity to start taking some seminary classes offered through Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. And those years were very precious to me. It gave me an opportunity to serve that church as a WANA game directory, game director. They called me the game guy. And, and I also was a coach for junior Bible quiz. And then I got an opportunity to lead a Sunday school class of about 40 families. And, and it was during that time when I realized that I had failed to complete my walk at that point because I'd never been baptized. But also by that time, it gave me a better understanding of what baptism was all about. And there was nothing that could keep me from that. And so it was in Raytown that my kids and I were, were baptized. And it was at that time that I began my lifelong study of God's word and how it applied to my life. <clears throat> Some more years passed and I decided to grow this epic beard. And my brother Scott and my dad Alan, they had started a club called the Kansas City Beard Mustache Club. Yeah, there's clubs like that. And it was during that time in that club that, that we all got a chance to serve the community through attending beard competitions. And yes, they have those too. And my dad and my brother and I were one time in St. Louis where we took first, second, and third place in a beard category that we were in. Yeah, they have different categories of beards too. But it brought the three of us closer together and, and it gave us an opportunity to serve the community 
There's many different beard mustache clubs around the United States, actually, in the world. And what's unique about, well, what's not unique about each one is that they will take and put these competitions together or do work to help raise money for, the, for charities. And the uh, charity that uh, Kansas City Beard Mustache Club had selected was Harvesters. And so we found ourselves collecting canned goods and raising money and doing all kinds of things to help harvesters. And one of the other things that we would do is once a month, we would all go to, as, a, as a team and we would uh, volunteer at harvesters, putting meals together for kids or senior citizens or whatever they needed. We sorted food and we just had a blast doing it. We were there once with a group of uh, cheerleaders and uh, they were on one side, we were on the other, and so we had this competition to see who could put the most backpack snacks together. And uh, it, it, was, it was a blast, we really enjoyed that. But one afternoon while I was there, I, I met my beautiful bride-to-be, Renee Mullendore, and her two daughters who were also there volunteering. And we realized that we went to the same high school together, but we really didn't know each other. And so we started dating and quickly fell in love. And then about two years after that, we decided that it was time for us to get married and to blend our families together. And so one Sunday, right here in this church after worship service, she and I were married. And at that time, we did blend our family together. And we now have five kids, Holly and Adam and Michael and Christian and Chrislin. And we moved into a home in Odessa where we are blessed to, to share that house with two very rambunctious dogs and four very unique cats. <laughs> two of which I had to chase around this morning to, to get them back in the house. Actually, the two dogs, too. <clears throat> but it's, it's been a wonderful past couple of years with my wife as we've learned to come together as a family and what it means not only to to have that family, but then also to be a part of this church family. And we've been so blessed by being in this church. It's offered us opportunities to serve <clears throat> where my wife has, has served in uh, Mission Friends and we both lead an adult Bible study class or Sunday school class where it gives us an opportunity also to, to put our discipleship training to work that we received here in this church. And we also, our family loves the Wednesday evening suppers and the Bible study that happens after. And the Tuesday night men's group that I'm a part of continues to bless me weekly. About <clears throat> a little over a year ago, I was encouraged to pray about taking part in the deacon training program. And I'd already felt God was calling my life in that direction, and this really confirmed it for me. But this last year and a half or so through the pandemic has been a very, very difficult time. And it's come close to breaking us down, but this church and the love that this church has has continued to build us up and to bring us closer to one another and to this church body. And for that, I'm so thankful. But as I mentioned, I really felt that God was calling my life in that direction. And so I'm very excited for, our, for this time in our church, for me personally, for my family, and for our church body, that it's going to give me an opportunity to, to serve you, our church body, as, as being a deacon. And as Chris has mentioned, <clears throat> and Joel as well, this opportunity to serve is something that we hold in high regard. And it, and it gives us an opportunity to share the love of Jesus Christ back to our church body and to our community. And so I'm very excited about what this future holds for, for the new deacon body and for our church. And I'm really excited to be able to serve the community at that capacity. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris and Mark, and it's going to be wonderful tonight, 
as we come together at 6 o'clock is the ordination service and the lion's share of that service. Uh, Doug Moran is going to give a challenge and uh, give us a word from the Lord, but the lion's share of that service is going to be as we gather around the church body, the deacons and the church body, and pray for these men and their wives. And uh, that's a very uh, unique opportunity, and I encourage you to come back and be a part of that. And again, if you're ordained as a minister, uh, as a deacon, or as a pastor, uh, I encourage you to come at five and be a part of the ordination council. I want you to turn to Mark chapter five for just a moment. And I have looked at the time, so I want you to know I'm going to put this cell phone. I don't have a watch anymore, but it has a good clock. I'm going to put it right here in my back pocket. And I promise you, I will sit down on time. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> That's pretty weak. That's pretty weak. Let's read these two verses, Mark chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. I'm going to go ahead and have you stand. You've been sitting there for a bit, and uh, that'll be good but mainly as we honor the reading of God's word. And I will start at verse, uh, verse 18. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged Jesus earnestly that he might remain with him. Jesus did not let him, but told him, go home to your own people. And report to them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went out and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and they were all amazed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. And uh, Lord, we thank you for how your word comes alive uh, in our lives. And uh, we just pray the Holy Spirit will speak to our hearts and draw us close to your throne of mercy and grace. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you. Consulting agency in New York City <clears throat> several years ago announced that most of the tra trainees for uh, the companies and the corporations uh, remember about 5% of the charts and graphs and all the statistics that, uh, that they hear in their training time. They remember about 5% of those things. But when the corporations and the organizations would tell the story uh, of, of those uh, organizations, they would remember 50% uh, of the stories. And uh, I, I know that that is the truth. When we come to the Word of God, uh, sometimes we can have point number one, point number two, point number three, and a poem that goes with it, and we can uh, stand and sing uh, Amazing Grace, and we go home and, and we forget. But whenever we hear stories, those are the things that, remember, that we remember. I want you to take your hymn book just for a minute, your hymn book, as if you knew there was a, such a thing. Uh, there is one there in the pew uh, rack. I want you to turn to hymn numbered 566. Hymn numbered 566 in this hymnal. So take it and look at it for just a minute. Look on with someone if you need to. The last verse, this, this hymn was written by Gene Bartlett. Gene Bartlett's dad, who was also Gene Bartlett, Gene Bartlett Sr., wrote the hymn, Victory in Jesus. Well, Uncle Gene, as we called him at Falls Creek, the many years that uh, I was in student ministry and took students to Falls Creek uh, Youth Camp, uh, he directed the music uh, a lot of those years. But Uncle Gene wrote this him tell the good news and you can read the first three verses but i want you to read the last verse just look at it as I, I read to you christ still lives in the world today tell the good news tell the good news 
giving strength to all souls who pray. Tell the good news, tell the good news, tell the good news, tell the good news, tell the good news that Christ has come. Tell the good news, tell the good news, tell the good news to everyone. The one thing that the world needs more than anything else is to know that there is a living Savior. That Jesus didn't die on the cross and that was it. Now, they did try to do that little razzmatazz uh, manipulation thing, the Pharisees, and pay some people off to say that he never did rise from the dead, but the disciples stole his body and hid it somewhere else. But that's just simply not the truth. Jesus rose from the dead. But that wasn't the end of the story. Jesus rose from the dead. He ascended to be with the Father. But through Holy Spirit, Jesus lives right now. And he lives in your heart and my heart as we choose to follow Christ as our personal Savior. And it's that story, it's that story that your friends and your neighbors are going to remember about you. When's the last time someone came up to you and said, you're a Christian, aren't you? When's the last time somebody did that? You're, a, you're one of those, aren't you? Yes, sir, I'm one of those because Jesus' spirit lives in our lives, lives in our heart. They tell me the story of Dr. Truitt who pastored First Baptist Church of Dallas for uh, ever and a day, I think 50 years. And uh, don't get excited, I'm not aiming at 50 years here. Uh, I'm way more than halfway there just as a matter of fact but I'm not aiming at 50 years but Dr. Truett did pastor that church for uh, I believe it was 49 all told but he used to walk the streets of Dallas and he would meet people there around the church if you've ever been to that church it's right downtown in the heart of, of the city of Dallas Texas and he would walk around and uh and one day he was walking along and a lady and her son came out of a, a grocery store and she kind of stumbled and, and uh, dropped her groceries and, and uh, Dr. Truett stopped and helped gather all the groceries up and help get some new sacks from the store and get them loaded up and, and help them get on their way. And the little boy looked up to his mom and said was that Jesus <laughs> they say that Dr. Truett when he died they had trouble finding a suit jacket or sport jacket to, to go with the slacks that he had he had rows and rows and hangers and hangers full of slacks but he didn't have the jackets to go with it because he invariably would see someone, some homeless per person, and he would take his coat off and give it to them. You see, a living Savior living in our lives that has transformed our lives is what our friends and neighbors are going to remember. Jesus told this man, he wanted to go with him in the boat, and he, boy, was ever there a change Jesus drove how many demons out? We couldn't count them. There's so many in him. Legion was their name. And he drove them out of this man. And this man who was, had run around uh, with no clothing on through the cemetery and would cut himself all the time and just holler and, and uh, hoop and, and scare everybody uh, to death, this man when they found him after Jesus ministered to him, was sitting there clothed and healthy and balanced and in his right mind. Why? Because Jesus had done a miracle in his life. Well, it's no wonder he wanted to go with Jesus. Can I get in the boat and go with you to the other side of the lake? And Jesus said, no, I want you to go home. And I want you to tell the story, tell your story, to your friends and neighbors. And the scripture said, as we, as we read, the scripture says 
that he did that, and all the people were amazed. If you want to amaze somebody, uh, you can stand and quote uh, the Bible to them from cover to cover. And that's a pretty good thing. Uh, I would uh, be impressed if you did that. If you uh, want to try to impress some people, you can learn the faith outline and F-A-I-T-H and how to share the gospel of Christ. If you want to impress some people, uh, you began to do Bible study in such a way that you are able to outline passages. But if you want to amaze people, you let them see in a very transparent way how Jesus is living in your life and how that story is alive and it continues on. If my testimony ended at the age of six when Jesus saved me and I was able to be baptized, if my story ended there, what a sad story that would be. But the story continues on. I have a story from a fellow pastor in the world. His name is Ramel Ding. And Pastor Ramel, I met him in the prison in Philippines, and Pastor Ramel uh, started going to church in that prison. And as he heard the stories of, of the believers and Christians there at Amazing Grace Church in the prison, uh, he gave his heart to Jesus. He still had done terrible crimes. In fact, in the Philippines, the crimes merited that he be executed. And Pastor Ramel was six hours from being executed. And for some reason or the other, uh, the president of Philippines, during the late hours after a party time that uh, where he... He did a little hooping and hollering himself. Uh, he got so happy that uh, at 2 in the morning, he signed, he signed a new executive order that said there will be no more executions in the Philippines. Pastor Ramel was six hours from losing his life. And so instead of being executed, God called him to pastor that church. You know, there's not anything that we can do in our life that Jesus can't transform and change. There's not anything that it happens in our lives that would negate us from being called to the ministry. Oh, we try to come up with lists and we make some different judgments in, in our minds and our lives, but when Jesus transforms us, everything becomes new and you start tracking newness in Christ Jesus. Pastor Ramel became pastor of Amazing Grace Church. He's a wonderful man, wonderful man. And I hope, I hope to be able to meet him again one day in this world. That's his story. Now, you're going to remember, you may not remember the passage of Scripture, but you're going to remember the demon-possessed man if I told you one word, you will go through your mind and study your Sunday school lesson so you'll be prepared for your teacher. Most of you. Good Samaritan, adults. Good Samaritan. Because most of you remember that story right now. You could stand up and you can quote that story right now. And you're ready now for your Sunday school class. Why? Because you remember that story. These men have given their testimonies of what God is doing in their life. I want to encourage you to come back tonight. Come back and celebrate with us as we formally agree, <laughs> formally agree, as we have agreed with God's calling on these three men's lives.
and be a part of that service. But more important than that, right now, if you'll bow your head right now, what's Jesus calling you about? Right now, what's Jesus calling you about? How's he wanting to, to uh, kind of tweak the story a little bit? Maybe he's got someone that he's put on your heart. I appreciate Miss Mary in the back. She's got somebody on her heart, and we were praying for that person. And there's evidence that Holy Spirit's at work because we get to go and visit with her about Mary's story. Maybe God's put somebody in your life, and you need to go talk to them. Maybe there is some circumstances going on and and God has placed very vivid things in your life where it's it, it's it's going to tweak the story some you see when you tell the good news you tell the good news that Christ still lives in the world today in your heart I don't know what your need is today. Maybe you just need to come and receive prayer. Maybe you want to come and accept Christ as Savior. Or maybe you, you, you're waking up and like Mark and it's time that you took that step of baptism. Maybe you need to come and, and be a part of a church and you want to formally uh, move your membership here. Whatever God is speaking to your heart, we're going to be here to receive you and to pray with you. And if you need further prayer, we'll provide for that as well. Father, we thank you for your goodness and love, and we thank you for this word this morning. We thank you for these three men that uh, have shared with us what you're doing in their life. And God, we just thank you that we get to be a part of it. What is it that uh, you're looking at in our hearts as you're searching us, areas where we need to say yes to you? pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me, please, as we sing about our beautiful Lord and wonderful Savior. And while we sing together, uh, Brother Joel and Miss Dawn are going to be here, and I'll be here uh, to receive you for whatever you need prayer for. Let's sing together. Lord, wonderful Savior, I know for sure, all of my days are held in your hand, crafted into your perfect plan. You gently call me into your presence. Guiding me by your Holy Spirit, teach me, dear Lord, to live all of my life through your eyes. I'm captured by.
placing on our lives, Lord. Let us not turn away, even when it's something that we're not expecting to hear or that may be hard for us to follow through. Lord, give us the courage, give us the strength to follow through with what you're calling us to do, Lord. Maybe whether that's reaching out to a friend who is lost, Lord, and doesn't know you, or whether that is um, donating a large sum of money, Lord, whatever it is, move our feet in faith, Lord. Lord, we thank you for how you've moved this morning and the testimony that, that our deacons and Brother Joel have been able to give, Lord. And we thank you for how you've worked in their lives already, how you're going to continue to work, Lord. And we thank you for calling them to service your body of Christ, Lord. And we just thank you so much for the abundant blessings that you continue to give us daily. Lord, thank you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. It's great to be together in God's house and just to worship. And uh, thank you, Miss Stephanie and the team, for leading us. John, would you lead us in our closing prayer this morning? Let's go to the Lord. Father God, we thank you for this day, Lord, that we can come and just be in your presence, Lord, and worship you. God, I thank you for the testimonies that we've heard today, Lord, and, and I thank you for the testimony that each one of us has and how you've worked in our life, God. Lord, just go with us this morning as we continue to worship, Father, as we go learn more about your word in our small groups. And Lord, continue to go with us this week and bring us back safely next week. Father, we love you and we thank you for your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. 